once it happened, like I knew, I knew what happened. Like I didn't get knocked out or anything. You're awake the whole time. Yeah. Why you nearly died. Yeah. Fuck. Unleashed with the Dingo and Danny, fueled by Monster Energy. Do you like zombies? Zombie movies? No, I'm so afraid of scary movies. Really? Yeah, I can't do it. Why not? Growing up, I never watched scary movies, and I don't know, just anytime there's like things that jump out at you, like it messes me up. I can't do it alone. He used to, uh, he used, to, I, I love scary movies, and he would like go to the spare room and. <laughs> And, and like listen to it and be afraid just listening to a scary movie sometimes i really like i don't know why i like scary movies i don't know i mean i they sometimes they get really scary like have you ever seen the ring i can't watch scary movies like oh. whatsoever i feel okay so i feel like if you go and watch a scary movie you're basically just setting yourself up to be stressed out and i already do that to myself in real life so i don't need to like go do that to myself for entertainment what kind of movies do you watch uh i I actually just started Nine Perfect Strangers. I guess that's, okay, I just watch Netflix and like Hulu and those kinds of things. Nine Perfect Strangers? Is that different than, oh, Stranger Things? I can't even watch Stranger Things because the first episode there was like something that like, it was like really eerie and creepy and I was like by myself at night and I don't know. I just get paranoid. Like when I was younger, I used to watch like those cold case things or like, you know the murders and stuff the real ones yeah oh, and yeah. then i would just stress myself out on like yeah well that really happened yeah there really are sick people doing weird things netflix kind of has like i guess a really scary range of they really kind of like glorified the the like the murder mystery thing yeah did you watch making a murder no yeah i did watch that that's scary but it's different because it's like real it's like interesting whereas like when someone tries to make something scary like and it's like extra i don't know i just like i can't there's something about it that i just don't like it maybe it's like the sound effects that add to it and like i don't know just jump like scares and like creepy people i mean danny creepy no <laughs> that's why i came to hang out this is fun <laughs> no we're not creepy we're fun guys like How? mushrooms <laughs> We're like walking mushrooms. <laughs> oh my god! What? Uh, how was um, how was the Olympics? The Olympics. It was crazy. I mean, as you guys know, it was the first time skateboarding was in the Olympics, and um, I don't know. Skateboarding's so disorganized, and for it to go to the Olympics, there was a lot of like hurdles to jump and. I don't know, with this past year and COVID and everything, it was like so up in the air and it was crazy that they were able to pull it off. But overall, it was like you got there and there was the Olympic bubble and that part was like weird. And I don't think there'll ever be another Olympics like that. Well, the next Olympics are in... A couple years. No, no, well, the summer, the, 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 yeah, no, well, three years till you're, you're, are you spilling? She just I, slammed a whole monster. Yeah. Did you see that? I like to wear my Do you monster. need a towel? No, 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 I'm good. What, do you got a hole in your lip? <laughs> That's what my mom used to tell me. <laughs> so you do have a hole in your yeah. lip. You miss a lot, huh? I, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> you good? good. I'm going to take a sip. Is it that time? It's that time. We like to do these like... <laughs> One time I drank four of these in a day. Wow. How'd Could you, you feel? Were you really after? good. I felt so good. I was like so much energy. And now I just freaking, dude, these are like my driving medicine, dude. It's crushed miles. So you're actually the first person I've sat down with and had this conversation. Let's go to the process of just even arriving in Japan. Because you, 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 all I could see was what I saw on social media. And uh, for those people that don't know, Lizzie actually went as team Finland. 
which is kind of another story in itself. And I guess we can go back there, but let's just like, cause uh, uh, watching uh, the things that weirded me out, well not weirded me out, but the things that I saw that were crazy was like, um, th there was, uh, was it on Niger's story? It was on Team America, but they had all the basketball players in this like hallway and everybody was t squeezed like tightly, tightly together. And it just, it, 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 in the times we're in, it was like, it looked, it looked weird. I know everybody's tested and everybody's good when they're in there, but I heard the, the stories of, were just kind of like nightmare stories of getting in the process of getting into the country, the testing, the, the, can you explain to us like kind of how, how your version was? Yeah. So to even get out of the country, you had to like take all these tests. Like you had to do like a 72 or 96 hour and then a 72 hour test and it had to be like at the right place that the certified the certification would be accepted in the airport in Japan and then you get there and then you get off the plane and then you go straight to like sitting in the terminal and you wait until the people in front of you have gotten tested and gone through all the kind of like checks like you just fill up paperwork and stuff yep. and you have to show all your your tests from America and I don't know. It's a lot of waiting because it's like they have to process whatever flights are in front of you. So some teams were waiting like, you know, all day because, you know, they were at the end of the day or, you know, there was like a bunch of planes that came before them. And luckily for me, it was only like f three or four hours, which was mellow, you know, like yep. and pretty much you just like sit and wait and then you get processed. You like spit in a cup and then you keep going and then they have to test everything and even for me, they they were like, oh, like, you you have to retest. But then for some reason, I didn't have to retest. Like, I don't. They came in and talked to me, and it's just very confusing and kind of stressful because you just want to get out of there because you're sitting, you're hungry, you just got off a plane, and you're just like cooped up in the airport for way longer than you know anyone should ever be. And even before the test, they're like telling you not to eat, but then you don't know when the test is and you're like, I don't, it's just like annoying to be honest. So they weren't feeding you while you were waiting? No. Is there a reason why they didn't want you to eat? Is it, does it, if, you're, uh, if your belly's not full, does, does, does it show like if you have a tiny bit of the uh, uh, COVID? I think it's like if you eat or drink right before your spit test, the food will still be in your spit test and it can contaminate the thing. I don't think it'll, necessarily show that you have COVID or something. I think it just dilute the test and make it harder to, there must be like some sort of percentage that your spit needs to be. It's just showing what everybody ate for lunch. It might, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I'm not a I'm Ham not sandwich, a yep. sushi. <laughs> oh, this person ate a bat. <laughs> Put him to the side. Oh <laughs> so you skated for Team Finland. How did that come, uh, how did that come about? So I was born with dual citizenship. Yep. And, you know, the skateboarding was added to the Olympics. And so, like, when it all started to kind of, like, actualize, I realized, like, all the different rules that the Olympics has and, you know, a lot of the talents in America. And so I felt like, you know, I could just go for Finland and then there could be more skaters that are, you know, a lot of the, t like I said, a lot of the talents in Cal like, in America and so just by going for Finland I could just get like one more person in the Olympics for the debut and like skateboarding basically could just like shine a little bit brighter. I think that's really cool because I read somewhere mm -hmm. or maybe I even spoke to you about that but I think what you did for uh for skateboarding just on that it was it, it really cool in itself because obviously uh you know there's yeah America is one of the strongest you know there's there, there's there's a lot of you know, talent here in America more so. And, and then Finland, cause you were the only person that went for Finland, right? Yeah, I mean, there was other people that like skated for Finland and went through the qualifiers, but you have to be like in the top 20 of the ranking list after they d like do all the, um, what's it called? You know, there's all the qualifications you have to meet cause they want to represent all the five regions and then they only take three per country. And so in the top 20, I was the only person from Finland. So I wasn't taking any one spot. You designed your own clothing? Yeah, and for the Olympics, because I was going for Finland, no one bought out the apparel on, like for the skate uniform. And so I was able to do my own thing and I got Vans to help produce my, um, my uniform. And I had, I designed it with my friend, Rachel Finley, who 
runs like a brand and so she's like super knowledgeable and like helped me come up with something really fun because I had this idea of kind of combining you know like skateboard culture and like finish my Finnish roots and I was able to like kind of like find this architect or I knew of this architect that basically designed the first skatable pool like ever really yeah his name was the where was the first skatable pool it was built in Finland, actually. No way. It was. And the architect's Oliver, Oliver Alto. Okay. And um, he built this pool, like, ages ago. And then we basically, like, took the kidney pool shape in America, and then it got, like, mass-produced. And it's, like, the kidney pool as we know it. No way. I never knew that. I didn't know that either. I always thought like the the pool skating come from just empty pools here in California, and the pool thing started here. That's that's really cool. I like how you combined like the skate culture, but then I, I saw that the uniform, and it was like so cool because with like the squiggly lines, and to know it's now more of like a pool shape. Yeah, he's he's a really cool architect. He was basically one of like the first people that started combining organic shapes with like the whole mid century modern thing. I'm also like such an amateur at like talking about this. this is my like rough understanding, but because it was all in Finnish, the conversation. <laughs> no, it's all on the internet. But um, how good's your Finnish? Terrible. <laughs> I mean, growing up, I we used phrases around the household, just like you know, like yeah. as kids, like as I was, I was, Vito. Uh, What's uh, that? Vito. I think that's Italian. Oh. Yeah, I have no idea. We used to grow. We grew up with a lot of Finnish snowboarders. And uh, they love candy. They do you love, love candy? candy? I do. They're like really obsessed with candy in Finland. I think. My favorite candy is actually black licorice, which is like super Finnish. Gross. I love black licorice. Uh, I, I think I've eaten two pieces of black licorice in my life. It's an acquired taste. Like you either love it or hate it. It's kind of like sushi, you know? It's like if you're not down with, you know, like raw fish, like you're, you're not down with sushi. Yeah. But I like sushi. It's an acquired taste. So maybe I'm gonna like black licorice? Maybe. It's an acquired taste. I'm gonna give it a try. You should, we'll get some on the way home. Love it. (laughs) You got a lot of press for your outfit. I did. I think, I mean, when I saw the outfits for, you know, the other countries, like it was pretty much like Nike bought out a lot of the bigger countries skate uniforms. And I felt like it didn't really look like skateboarding it didn't and that kind of bothered like i felt like that bothered me when danny first went to the olympics in 2002 their their outerwear was roots and they had like oh, berets no, and bad. like their it outfits were so fucking bad it was like it was it was it, it was so not snowboarding these guys did a really good representation of it but seeing danny in like a little beret Dude, we were wearing berets <laughs> and it was like I don't know how we could make them look so uncool. And then like, we were all like, these hats are so lame. And then we got home and they were selling for like $2,000 a pop. And we all like basically gave ours away. Like shit, we should have saved that cool roots hat. You're right though. Like watching the boys skate in those tank tops and the weird stuff. It was like a weird, uh, it it, it was, and it was like, kind of like, I don't want to say it, but like somewhat of a Nike commercial. We're all fans people here, by the way. Like we run Mm -hmm. fans. We're not here to, (laughs) <laughs> I mean, not it, not to knock any of the skaters because it's like, you know, you, you don't, as a skateboarder, you, you didn't get that choice. And also, I think a lot of people just wore whatever was like the most comfortable for like the, the coolest thing you could find, like as in like temperature, because it was so hot. And so everyone wearing the tank tops and wearing like shorts and, you know, looking like tennis players or basketball players. It was because that was the most breathable material that you weren't dying in. Like anyone who wore long sleeves or like pants, like you were taking one for like, you're just sweating it out in there. Like I was sweating because it was, I had an ice vest actually. I saw that. So everybody had ice ice vest. No, no, no. Everybody had an ice vest. Not everybody. Not everybody. Just Finland. Just people that thought about it. So so I kept noticing that people had these weird vests on. They looked like a... like a military or like a SWAT uniform. It was like a SWAT Like ammunition. That's what it looked like. It's what it looked like. But they kept, uh, the announcers did a good job of trying to tell people, but for people that weren't actually there, can you tell us how hot it really was? Like, have you ever skateboarded in conditions like that? It was so hot. It's definitely the hottest I've ever skated in. It, the, like, it's just like the dead of summer there. It's, you know, the sun, there's not shade. 
Like if you're in the shade, that helps tremendously, but there's like a couple umbrellas around the whole venue and you know, the, the sun in direct sunlight on you was like intense. It's like reflecting off the concrete when you're in the park, it's reflecting off all walls. You're pretty much getting baked. And then like, even when you're in the shade, it's just the humidity is so high, you know, it's like, it, it's nice in the shade, but it's not, you're still like breathing water. I heard when the wind blow kind of like it would, like it was like a burning blow. It was, but it was nice. It was better than when it was still. Cause the still just like, you just felt like you're getting cooked. Like you're pretty much in the sauna. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. I think they need some shaded coverage for the next one. Put it in the dome, right? Yeah. I will say they looked a little weird, like seeing skateboarding, not seeing skateboarding in the Olympics, but the course was like kind of plain. Like it was missing like a little bit of like graffiti or like signage or something. No, it just looked weird because it had Olympic rings on it. Is that what it was? Because it was all like white and gray and there was, was no graffiti. I feel like it's just like the logos that you're not used to seeing. So I think you're right by it. It's like it's weird seeing a park with Olympic rings and like looking really clean. And I think they could have like if you would have done different branding, it would probably look like any other contest. And then also there was no fans. How do you how do you deal skating? How, the, the, the vibe probably was was not as what you, you know, you've been used to. I mean, we're getting used to it now because it's been so long. But the no fans there had to be kind of tough as well, right? It was it was definitely weird, like it being empty, but then at the same time, after like not going to events and not being around like a giant crowd, it wasn't that weird. It was just like strange to know like this is a big deal, but no one's like here. And like basically everyone's on the other side of the cameras and um you could feel the pressure. Like you saw people were like they knew this was like the time to like make or break yeah and i don't know for me personally i think it definitely like was nice that there i wasn't dealing with like a ton of people because i don't know it's like one less some people like thrive off like the energy of like everyone being around and for me i just try to tune it out anyway so for it to not be there i was like okay another thing that's out of my control but yeah Yeah. i'm stoked are you stoked now that all that's over uh I'm, it's really weird. Like, I feel like I've finally been able to process like the three years of like working towards that and, you know, kind of making my goal. And so that's really rewarding, but it's really weird to think that like I went to the Olympics or I'm an Olympian and I don't know, all of a sudden I've been hit on the head with the magic wand of like, you're a real athlete according to the rest of the world. Finally. Yeah. Finally, a real athlete. Isn't that crazy? It is. But in the end, it was like, it felt like any other skate contest when you were just like there and you like didn't think about it. Yeah, that's nice though. It was. And I think skateboarding kind of like shown, it's tr- like it show, uh, shown or showed? Shown or showed? Showed. It showed it's like true colors. Like I feel like it was represented really well for like all the people that got to see it. And also, like, the people that got to see it for the first time. That I think that was the thing, too. Like, I- even here in America and I think around the world, like, BMX and skateboarding, uh, you know, people, it, it, it almost felt like the Olympics had taken, like, you know, a, a leap out of X, books ga- X Games book and were like, all right, like, because the people didn't know, that, and, and that's the whole thing. There were so many new eyeballs on it and so many people so curious about it. And, like, even, like, um, for the, for the, the street skating females they're like the, the girls are so young it's crazy of like the age of some of these girls right and and i think like the world didn't under the, I, I, I don't think the world was kind of ready for that definitely not i think the olympics is so it has such a long history and it's very um kind of there's a lot of rules and i think skateboarding definitely like threw a hammer at their rule book as as far as like age and like showing that you know it's kind of all inclusive was the drug testing super serious over there um i actually so i got like you know the covid tested every day but at every other event except the olympics i was just like so heavily tested and i actually was really glad that i didn't get a bunch of drug tests because they're really annoying like you pretty much like have to go pee in front of like a person which i get for like you know i get why they do it 
and I, I back that, that there's like rules and like ethics, but I always got picked and <laughs> there was times where they're like, oh, like you, you're too hydrated. So you have to keep like, you have to keep yeah, producing eat this granola samples. bar and sit here. You're like, but I just peed. Yeah, no, it literally <laughs> happened like after a contest in, um, in Brazil, I was stuck like. I was there for like five hours. I was hungry. It was after the event. I didn't like podium or anything. They're just like, we're, we're testing you. And, and I was just starving and irritated. And like, I like gave them a bunch of samples, but my like, you know, I had, I was overhydrated. It was hot there. So I was just drinking a ton of water and like, it has to be a certain percentage or something. Like it can't be too diluted. Were they smelling it? Like, no, no, oh, there's yeah. like the whole, sorry. <laughs> There's like the whole like test system and they mm. like check it and you know, it's like with chemicals and or not maybe not chemicals, but like, like a microscope or like a special odometer. Yeah, they thing. look through something, right? Yeah. And they're like, no, nah, it's a little too clear. Pretty much. And it's just it kinda sucks when it's always you. I wonder if there was like beef between like the drug testers and the COVID testers. Oh, like, I wonder oh, if they like oh. they like didn't see eye to eye. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, I'm gonna take her now. Well, we have her scheduled for a COVID <laughs> test. They're all so serious, so I'm I wouldn't be surprised. You ever have a test somebody show up to your house to test you? All the time. It happened so many times. And I, the one of the first times it happened, I it was like they came super early in the morning and at first I thought it was like a person that was on drugs coming to my house like a, I, a like, You're a like no one comes home. over here at 8 a.m no I on? live in the hood like you don't just go up to someone's <laughs> house really early in the morning and I was home alone like uh like my husband Axel had just left and I was like of course like this happens right now and I was like worried and then I like looked through the camera and I'm like who is this and I'm, it's so early that I'm like trying to listen and put it together and finally I'm like oh it's the the, the drug testing people it's not like some homeless person coming up knock, to my knock. door it's Where USADA are you? you're in Venice somewhere I live in Long Beach and my house used to be a trap house so what? like it wouldn't be shocking if like someone came over cause thinking it was like you know the they house it used to be they were actually looking for smack you're like no 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 we bought the house off them six months ago. They're next door. They're like, sure. <laughs> How'd your drug test go? Like, oh, all right, maybe. My drug tester was like, was was like, you 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 thought I was coming to do drugs, or like you thought I was the one that was gonna come do drugs. I'm testing you for drugs, and I was like, I know that, but like you don't understand where you are right now and what time it is, and like, it's too early. You guys got married last year. Yeah. So Axel and I, we we did. We got married. You guys are like a, a power couple within <laughs> skateboarding. Yeah, I guess so. We're, I don't know, Axel's super sweet. He's, he's the best. How is it to have him by your side, you know, to have, you know, one of the world's best skateboarders by your side as, not a coach, but like uh, as a husband, but it's like, you know, do you feel like that gives you some extra, a bit of oomph? You guys push each other? Uh, we definitely like push each other and have fun. But as far as like coach or anything like that, like when it comes to skateboarding and taking advice, it's like we definitely like, I'm not good at taking his advice. I actually take offense to it sometimes. You do? Yeah, cause he's so good. Like obviously, okay. So Axel's a street skater obviously. And you know, he is very good at his thing and I skate transition and like pools and that kind of thing. And I don't know, he's very, he he'll come skate with me and like i feel like everything comes so easy whereas i go to the streets and like you know the streets are messed up like you don't get anything for free like you gotta you gotta pay and you do and so i don't know like i said i feel like it comes easy to him so when he tries to give me advice i'm just like easy for you to say what about what about when he comes and skates, skates transition no that's what i'm saying oh okay like, that's what pisses you off no, I love it. Like, it's so fun. But the, then sometimes he tries to give me advice and I'm just like really sensitive. Okay. I feel like it's just within a couple, like I'm always trying to push my girlfriend on a snowboard and it usually backfires until like the moment where it goes well and she gets super fired up. But wow, it's tough. Maybe you give some Danny some tips. He's on the, he's, he's but then a, I'll take, like, I'll go snowboarding with like couples and I'll be like, Hey, you go do your thing. And I'm going to like work with her. Cause I can't listen to you guys yell at each other anymore. It's, it's definitely like a balance. And also I would say like, 
if you're just like skating in a group and like i don't know we're all just doing our own thing usually that's how like it goes and it's super fun but then the second someone comes up to you especially like i don't know your person they like try to give you some advice you're just like yeah i can see that oh well that's like you know it is what it is you just care about what they say and so it's easy it's to true. take it personal it's true you were the first female as any has any other female done the loop no, you're the not, only f- you're, not yet. It's open though. Like anyone can do it. <laughs> anyone? Yeah. How many times did you try the loop before you got it? So Tony set it up and you know, it's like you have one practice day where they don't take the pads out or anything. And then the next day they had the, there was a live event and they did that. And then I was still like trying to figure out the technique for it. And so I'd skated it for like quite a few hours, like maybe like five or six hours at this point. And then after the event was over, I was like, they were about to take it apart. And I was like, wait, like, I still want to skate it. Like, can, can I skate it? And Tony like had them like keep it up. And I pretty much was just trying, there was a, a bunch of people that were actually still trying. And at some point, like the advice that I'd been told, like someone else told it to me again and it clicked. And I tried it and then I like stuck to the wall and I was like, okay, this is how you do it. And at that point I was like really freaked out. Cause I was like, okay, this is like the make or break point. Like if I'm going to do this, like I'm going to keep going or I have to just stop now before I get too close and then try to have this conversation with myself. <laughs> and pretty much I was like, okay, like it's either going to work out or I'm going to like get completely broke off. But I was like, if I just like, slowly piece it together i think it'll work out and it did for those for our listeners that don't know who tony is tony's tony hawk yes. and uh and for anyone living on the rock that doesn't know who tony hawk is you should be somewhere else right now and lizzie is pro on birdhouse which is tony hawk's skateboard company and uh lizzie was the first ever female to do the loop on a skateboard which is one of the gnarliest fucking things ever done on a skateboard it's crazy there's nothing like it that's why it's like so challenging like every time like when you skate transition usually when you go up a wall you come back down or like just keep going or you literally just like it's just a carve and you just have to end up on the other side and once you start to do the thing you can't you can't hesitate and i think that's hard for a lot of people because you basically have to go through the whole motion and it's just like in your head that doesn't make sense like everything's telling you like a, like don't do this cancel and what does like the angle feel like when you're going down is it like mostly just straight up and over or are you really kind of like carving into it throughout the whole thing so there's a line in his and pretty much it feels like a carve and it's kind of similar to like a cradle but at, like as far as the upside down part but like as far as you know attempting it it's nothing like a cradle and it's just it's one of those things that it's so simple but it's really 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 fucked up where's the like the the com the full commitment part like where's the because obviously you slammed a lot right i mean going into the pads it's not terrible but like every time you're going from like the roll in and then you have all that speed and you just go into like pretty much a stop and so you're taking impact there and then I basically was able to figure out the the technique and then we just I got in like a rhythm and then we'd like take a pad out every time I like you know did the rhythm like a, a couple times and I was like okay let's keep going let's keep going until we got to like the last pad and I was like okay I'm gonna do it and then I they took out the pad and I was like same thing and pretty much on that first one I I didn't I don't know what happened, but I just like, I fell before I even got to the top. And so there's like a picture of me upside down at 12 o'clock, like pretty much on my knees. Sliding through it? Yeah. Wow. And I basically go through the whole thing and just like somehow make it to the other side, which is really, really like, like that's like the last thing you want to do. It's like bail before you get into the thing. And luckily it worked out. And then I just like went back and then pretty much almost made it through I think I just like leaned back or forward and it was like five or six times trying it without the pads which is a lot 
usually people like take out the pads and then they're just like through and I don't know it was there was one I made it and everyone rushed to me because I like made it all the way through and then I fell like five or six feet out of it and they're like you did it and I was like I didn't feel like I did it just because it wasn't like a clean landing and so they're like okay like Tony's like yeah um if you want to go and do it again like go and then I like ran back up there and then like on the fifth or sixth one I like made it through and was just like on the other side of the parking lot which it's crazy it's just literally in a parking lot like you're just trying the loop that's so gnarly <laughs> also on the session before me uh Tom Shar he tried it and he like went out the side and just like landed on you know next to the pads next to the pads on the concrete because like, when, when you're doing it everything it's like you're all right dropping and people are, are rotating and it's like you know you're watching people almost die pretty much like you can get messed up even with the pads like there's someone who like looped out and they do like a flip and a half or like they like flip and then like hit the still hit the wall like there's a lot of ways to not do it right and I just remember when I was trying the day I was trying it I would listen and wa listen to the sound of when people would do it right and only watch when it was people that were like looking consistent or like in control yeah that makes sense do you ever look at like the cradles and the skate parks differently now after that are you ever like hmm no I feel like I've always like thought I thought the loop would be okay just because I was able to skate the cradle. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. As far as full pipes and stuff, now I look at those and I'm just like, Ugh. I hope I never go on a trip with one of those now because they're all going to be like, all right, you ready? <laughs> it's so different though. Like the, I think when you try the loop, it's, it's not like, can you do it? It's more like the room for error is so high that is it worth doing this? Mm hmm. What's Tony saying at this point? Like, how, how, like, is he, obviously he's very calm and having, is he not? Wait, keep going. Like, like it, it, when, when he's, because obviously he's got to look at this thing and kind of, you know, he created it, right? Like it's, it's, it's this, it's something that is not, it's not for everyone, but, you know, having a bunch of young kids and up and coming and this like, does he is he calm as he's talking to people or does he kind of sit back like what's his involvement as he's watching people do the loop i think he, he's like a big supporter like he's like your cheerleader when you're like there like i think he's just as excited for like i don't know anyone doing it their first time because it's a big deal it's pretty yeah. gnarly i think like maybe his take on like him personally doing the loop i think he's he's been there done that and he it's kind of over it. That's what I was thinking. Like, I would be, if I was Tony, I'd be like, oh, no, I got to do the loop again. Here it comes. But also. Everyone wants it. I think, like, he's watched a lot of the gnarliest slams, and I think that, like, wears on a person. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, it's, it's this thing you've created, and, like, seeing people, like, make it is awesome, but then seeing the people that it takes out is, it's not fun. It's, it's disgusting. Like, it's terrible. Speaking of disgusting, the slam you had that almost killed you. So Dan, I showed Danny for the first time driving down today. He hadn't seen it. Yeah. For good reason. Whoa. <laughs> and the first time uh, Miles showed me uh, the video, there was no sound. And then the second time I heard it with the sound. And that was probably the gnarliest thing I've ever heard in my entire life is Lizzie flying. So it was at Elliot Sloan's ramp. Yep. And, uh, and it, it, it ended up being at one of the, it was at the end of the day, right? It was. And um, <laughs> coming up, c c c you kind of stepped off the you kind of stepped off the board what what, what exactly happened at that moment where it all kind of because you'd been skating that you've you've done it a million times i've never done it oh you had it this is my first time doing trying to do the like mega or elliot's setup and i don't really skate that big of stuff like i skate vert ramps and stuff and those are tall but this whole thing is like of a different proportion and i think Elliot's house has so many different things and it's it's really hard to tell how big something is until you're there and you know because this thing is sitting next to a bunch of other giant pieces you're like oh it's not that bad but 
you know, you take that anywhere else and like size it up next to something normal and it's, it's massive. And the amount of speed you get and I don't know, it just changes, you know, the dynamics of everything. Like, you know, it's, the gap itself is huge. The, the drop is pretty big. And, you know, I don't, it's just a whole different thing. It's like, it's the difference between like sprinting and like long distance running. Yeah. So, you know, it's all running, but it's different. And, you know, at the time I, I was doing a lot of different things and I was actually leading up to that day, the day before I had a migraine and I was, I actually got it from being at that ramp and I was like about to like try to do the gap and I, I don't know, I just like got a migraine and so I like wasn't feeling, I didn't feel good. I like literally had to have my friend drive me home. I was like throwing up in the back seat. And the next day I, you know, I wasn't gonna go back there. And then the team manager came over and was like, hey, like I'm going over there if you wanna come and, I'll, and it's gonna be mellower. And so I was like, oh, like that could be fun. I could be down. And just in the moment I was like, yeah, let's do it. And um, Axel and, and uh, Axel was there too. He was like, oh, I'll, I'll, like, I'm down to come if it's like mellow and not like, you know, like the birdhouse team thing going on. And we literally got married like a week before. And so there was like a lot of like excitement for that. Like, I don't know, we were still like super like excited about that whole thing. And that day we're like, oh, we should sh like, we should just share that we got married. And so we posted on Instagram and drove down to Elliot's ramp. And then, you know, went down there like warmed up and then like kind of got to it and then Axel was behind me as I went and he was about to go next and pretty much I went for it and I just like I don't know I just like felt like I glitched if that makes sense mm -hmm. like I, I think I just like hit a point where it's like my body was just like shut down and essentially it was just like stress and like I said I had a migraine the day before. I was getting migraines for like weeks before that. And so I just felt like I wasn't a hundred percent. And, um, you know, with all the things going on in the world, like with like COVID and just like, you know, there's a lot of protests and there was the election stuff. And I felt like, I don't know, kind of all that was affecting me and like where I was at. And um, I pretty much just like had that accident happen and once it happened, like I knew, I knew what happened. Like I didn't get knocked out or anything. You're awake the whole time. Yeah. Why you nearly died. Yeah. Fuck. How many, what, what did you exactly break? I broke my femur and I broke three transverse proce processes on my spine. And like when I was laying on the ground, I was like, just, you know, gasping for air. Cause I knocked the wind out of myself. But I was like, you fell from. But you were up, pretty, I mean, not up, but like you. I saw where you take the slam, and then you're like, kind of like, push up off the ground, where you're like, oh my god. It was almost like a, it was like a two part series, like, hoof, boom into the, just smash my face into the back, and then that's one, and then two, and then when you hit the scream from the video is oh oh. I watched the first. I, I watched it once, and I said, once I heard that scream, I could never watch that video again. I could, it's probably the gnarliest slam ever to happen. It's like a car crash, you know, it's like, it's two, it's like two and one, like you're saying. And, you know, the gap is huge. It's like at least, you know, 15 feet. And then the drop is like another, like, you know, 10 to 15 feet. Honestly, I haven't been back there since. And, um, I don't know. I think once you like look at it, you, I don't know. It's just like, it's, it's gross. And I don't know. I, when I was on the ground, I was like, okay, well, I'm all here. I can like move, like I can move my fingers and my toes. So I'm good, but I'm not getting up. Like I, that was like too messed up. I should like get checked out and stuff. And I was just in shock and it took like Axel, it took him a second to get to me. Cause he, it was his first day there and he didn't know how to get down from the top of the ramp. Like obviously he got up there, but like he was like just panicking and trying to like figure out how to rush to get to me and was like, I don't know. He like basically was started running the wrong way, running this way, and Aww. the whole setup is like really big and crazy. So, as you can imagine, like he pretty much, aside from the fact that I'm screaming, like, like I don't know, my best friend thought I died. 
Yeah, it sounded like you were almost dying. How, how, and this was something that was kept under wraps. Nobody knew, like your wedding, nobody, nobody knew that this happened for a long, long time that you had hurt yourself. Nobody had seen the crash until, I, when did you guys reveal on Tony's podcast? Yeah, so it wasn't until um, like May. And pretty much I like, you know, I, I went to the hospital and then I had surgery like the next day. And after that, I was pretty, I was pretty much like, I don't know, like I didn't want to see the slam because I felt like I would be reliving it. And I was just like dealing with, you know, all the trauma of like that happening. And you know, even poor Axel, like, you know, that day we posted, we got married, we're get like our phones were getting blown up by like oh, yeah. congratulations. And then I'm in the hospital and like, he's just trying to like contact like the people he needs to and keep in contact with me. And like, you know, our phone batteries are going down like crazy and like, um, he can't even come in and see me because of COVID. And it was, it was really hard to like communicate with the hospitals and just like figure out all that stuff. And I don't know, I was there just thinking like, am I gonna, am I gonna like be a, like have a career still? Like what's going on? You had to learn to walk again pretty much. I did. And it was, I don't know, that whole process was like really, I don't know, hard to go through just because it's like such a part of, I don't know, like I'm a very active person and like, I don't know, obviously I'm an athlete, but you know, using your body is like a big part of your identity and like how you experience life. And so for me, I was like trying not to get too like, I don't know, in my head about all that stuff, but it, it was, it was super scary. Like it was definitely like a really terrible thing to happen. But at the same time, I felt like I grew a lot from that experience. So I don't regret anything. And I think if anything, I've learned like, I don't know, like I need to just listen to my body more and like how, you know, important that is, especially for what I do and just knowing, knowing when's when and, you know, like I said, so many things were going on and like, it wasn't just like skateboarding. It was like the world was crazy. Yeah. We have to deal with so much now on just day to day life and the complications just to be able to do things or go to events or deal with our families or watching the news or whatever it is, there's so much that's condensed and it's like our brains are like, you know, like to, I still haven't been home in like nearly two years, you know, because it's Im almost impossible to get back into Australia. So it's, it's there are these things that, you know, we have to, you know, deal with. You're dealing with that. So you have to basically nearly died, have to learn how to walk, well, just get married, have a crash, nearly die, have to learn how to walk. What was the timeline on you getting back on the skateboard and qualifying for the Olympics and skating the Olympics? Because it still hasn't been a year since the crash. So the rankings before the slam and before COVID actually in general, like were really, for me, they were like, I was way up top and there was supposed to be like quite a few more events to happen, but because of COVID, a lot of them got canceled and there was only one more contest before the Olympics. And that was in May. And I, I first pushed on a skateboard in March. So I don't know, I, I say I skated in March very feebly because that's not necessarily at the level that, you know, I skate at. And, you know, I really didn't start skating until right before that contest. And um, it, I went on a little road trip to Seattle, or sorry, uh, to Salt Lake City with a few people. And, you know, there's a, a really good, you know, Vans park out there that's like, you know, kind of like the, it's a park series park, but it's like the Olympic parks. And, you know, it was in altitude and literally just within two days, I like tried to skate like how I would normally skate. Cause in my head, like nothing's changed, but then my body just wasn't there. And, you know, I, I skated all day for two days and then my body was just like, no, like no more. Just cause it was, it was such a shock to it. And, you know, you really have to like work back up to where you were and get the endurance back and, you know, work through atrophy. And I don't know, it was crazy. Yeah, I, I think when one thing though, like you really said that I think is super huge in, you know, in action sports is like, you kind of get to this level where you're on top of your game and you'll have this huge fall or slam or injury. And it's like, 
the mental aspect because from pain you know everyone deals with pain at such a high level but it's more of like that feeling of being like oh no am I going to be able to skate like that again in a sense you know and I think it's really hard for people to look ahead in that sense because from all the injuries I've had where it's been like oh no like I'll I had knee surgery I'll never be able to feel good again or whatever and then but really it's like the body's like this magical thing that will kind of heal itself you know and it's not like you're losing these skills or they just got knocked out of your head and they usually always come back and so much stronger you know and that's a huge thing to like for pro athletes I think to really think about in their mind is like don't let the this fear worry of where you're going to be in a few months or ever again because it's like I would say almost like 99% out of a lot of those big crashes people always come back even stronger because they're working their body back to where it was but by the time they feel good again they're almost at like that 110% strength from where they were before it. I think that applies to you know things outside of skateboarding too like that's like a life skill I think you know anytime there's something like things are going really great and then something terrible happens where you have to like work back to that point or you know rebuild there's a lot of it takes a lot to build your confidence again and Mm -hmm. it's scary because you're you're just vulnerable and you know no one I feel like a lot of people are scared of vulnerability and you know if you don't have the right support system like it's terrifying and you're faced with a lot of truths that you know you don't it's not something you want to deal with, but it's something that if you do deal with, like you can end up even better on the other side. Like you're saying, like you Mm -hmm. end up stronger and um, just knowing how to deal with that process and, you know, being patient with yourself. And, you know, that's a huge thing. I think, you know, it's really easy to be nice to everyone else, but if you know how to be nice to yourself and like let yourself relearn how to, you know, get back to wherever, or like not be afraid after, you know, this terrible thing happened, that's, it takes a lot of guts and courage and um, it's not easy. And I think that gets overlooked. Yeah. Well, people look at, you know, athletes or you guys like these like superhumans. And I don't think they realize like exactly how hard you guys work or how much you guys put your bodies through what you're going through. They just expect you guys to be on point all the time. Yeah, and I I think like you're saying, it's like people think you're superhumans, but it's like actually the opposite. It's like no, you're just you're human, and you just put in the work, and you just wear a cape every once in a while. And <laughs> uh, I actually listened to this thing the other day that was like really cool to hear. It was a, it was another podcast, and I, I'm really terrible at remembering names and things like that. But what I got out of it was that like, you know, we have these moments where like people you know show off this thing and they've done this amazing great thing and it's like oh they've made these leaps and they've really like all of a sudden like they're brilliant but you know they had to break down the path to get there and it was actually like a step-by-step thing that was dumbed down that doesn't feel brilliant at the time but the the sum of all that work looks like brilliance at the end and so i think that's really cool to hear just because i feel like you know, in so many things, we we don't picture ourselves doing these amazing things because you're not the, you're not at the end yet. You're not like you don't see the path. But once you start breaking something down, it's actually very like I don't know achievable. I like that. I like it too. I'm like picturing like Machu Picchu. I'm like you see all these like- photos of people there, but no one ever shows how many steps they took to get there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I I'm like, I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking... What are you I, thinking about? Like, where's, like, what, what's the what, what's the most exciting thing for your future in, uh, in skateboarding? What are you, like, looking forward to the most? The funny thing about, like, how I see skateboarding is it's so fluid that, like, I don't... I feel like I'm terrible at setting goals. Like, I'm terrified of setting goals. But I always... Like, I love the process, and I love... You know, just seeing kind of what comes my way and like working off those opportunities and, you know, just really like living in the moment, but still like being proactive and being, I don't know, just present and accountable. And I feel like so far, so like I've been really fortunate with everything. And, you know, I feel like even when I first started skating and the idea of even me having a career was, it was 
it was too hard to have as a goal because, you know, it's like there, there was no path to get to, you know, being a pro skateboarder on the female side of things. And, you know, I just, you know, took each opportunity as it came and it kind of just like blossomed into this like ton of opportunities, which is really exciting. You won your first X Games when you were a teenager, right? Yeah, I think I was 17. Bang. Or wait, I was 20. I'm silly. I'm sorry. I was 20. I wasn't a teenager. Almost. Just, well, be, like, like re really old teenager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ha, 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 what, what, what? It's, still a, it's still a young age to have to, you know, go through something like that. But that's, was that, was that a goal as like a 15 year old? You're like, all right, I want to make it to X Games. Or was that something that just kind of happened? Not even when I was, I didn't start skating till I was like 14 and you know, I started doing contests and it was more just about like being around like people that were like fun and that were into skating and just like pushing themselves and learning new things. And like, I just felt like I found my community and you know, it wasn't about the contest. It was more just about the people. And you know, when X games came up, it was really exciting because I felt like it was the first event that I could tell my friends and family outside of skateboarding that I'm a part of this thing and you know I'm really doing it and I'm not just like you're just hanging my out hobby. at the skate park you're doing it yeah and I think that was like a really big deal like I I'm so appreciative of like everything that that the X Games has done what is it what, what does it mean to you to be a uh, pro on you know uh birdhouse and and travel around the world with tony hawk it's it's really surreal just because i feel like like i said like seeing myself as a like skateboarding as a profession like wasn't really it didn't feel like an option when i started skating and you know being on birdhouse with tony's like support is amazing just because he he's kind of like the best cheerleader ever and I, I feel like you represent skateboarding so well. And I really look up to him in so many ways. Like, I feel like he's like probably one of the most savvy Instagrammers are, that I know. And he's like, I don't know, he knows how to like talk to people. Like he's like a really good public speaker. And I'm just like, like it just looks like it goes so effortlessly for him, but he's put in all the work and he deserves it all. But it's just really cool to see it all firsthand. And um, it definitely like, pushes like I push myself like seeing how like how much he like goes for it and he, he's still ripping he's one of the most savvy humans of, of all time he's 52 or 53 or 50, whatever he is now and I think he's almost more relevant today than he was back then and you're right savvy on Instagram savvy on all these things he just takes opportunities and he, and he and he runs with it and takes it to the full level so it's like I I agree with you you know He's like one of the best people of all time to look up to. And we're just lucky to have him in our industry and us to be able to be like, hey, put him on the phone or whatever, which is crazy to me, you know, like, so it's it's it for you to be under the team and be in the wing. And, and, and that's just that's your buddy. It's like that's that that's that's that he's a superhuman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he is. I feel I feel that. But I don't know. And also, like, just being on the birdhouse team, it's so rad just because, you know, I when I first got on Birdhouse and Tony was like, yeah, I want you to be a part of the team and not just like, you know, someone who gets flow boards, which was a huge deal at the time because, you know, there wasn't women on the actual team for any skateboard company. Like that was lame at the time. That's what like it was considered. And so really, yeah, I felt like, I don't know, skateboarders are so over critical and harsh. And, um, you know, I, I love that people have opinions. I think that's important. Yeah. But, I think at the time the like stigma for having like a woman or a girl on your team was like, oh, like this dude's better than them. So why would you have like, if I can, if she can do a kickflip, well, can't I be on the birdhouse team? Like, I don't know, just stuff like that. Do you think that's changed a little bit now or it's still kind of looked at this, that, that way? It's definitely changed. I think a lot of that stigma has gone. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it, it doesn't exist. You know, like a lot of skateboarders are like, immature boys so of course there's like <laughs> yeah well one of those immature boys have never done the fucking loop <laughs> true true oh uh, well that time just actually flew by it's 
crazy, but what uh, we're so appreciative of you at, here at Monster Energy, and we love you, Lizzie, and you're one of the coolest human beings ever, and you rocked it at the Olympics. I tried to match, I got trying to close, cl I tried to like, but anyway, you think I'm an idiot, I'm silly. Um, what we do at the end here is Danny does this like lightning round, and you gotta answer him in like two seconds, flat. Okay. And they're, they're like, they're, they're, he, 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 get ready, he's got doozies in here. He, he puts a lot of effort into where these questions come from. Okay. Thanks Major very effort. Seriously. And you have the biggest stack that we've ever actually had. So if there's any ones you want to pass, you can totally just say pass on one. I'm excited. Okay. I feel special, actually. <laughs> We're okay. lucky. We're special. You are special. We're special. We're lucky to have you. I'm happy to be here. Um, well, this one kind of goes in. Maybe, maybe you'll say who's on my mind or on our mind, but we don't know. What is, in your opinion, the best skateboard graphic of all time? Ooh. This is a, t this is such a hard question. I know this could get you in some trouble. Um, you got six seconds. Okay, I'm just gonna go with like you my first graphic ever was an element board, and it was a Tosh Townsend board, and it was this yeah. like really trippy like mirrored graphic, and you know it's not like a, it's not like an iconic graphic like you know like the old ones, but I just remember like loving that one, and I. I don't know. That one has a lot of sentimentality in my heart. That's so cool because I'm a huge Tosh fan. He was like one of my favorite skaters to meet like in California when I moved here at like 18. And just, he really lived up to it. He's a nice guy too. I've never met him, but he seemed awesome. Seems. Seems. He's still around. He's, he's here. Um, is there a trick Axel does you wish you could do? So many. Uh... I wish, I wish I had kickflips like him. Or like, I don't know, when he did like, front, when he does frontside flips. They're cool. Um, weirdest skate moment at the Olympics, in your opinion? Mm. I don't even know how to answer that question. I feel like it was just weird just being at the Olympics, like not wearing any normal clothes. Like you pretty much wear your country clothes and then you go to the course and then you wear your like skate uniform. Like that was just like really bizarre just cause it felt like, I didn't feel like myself. Yeah, it's like you're in a cult. Yeah. I felt yeah, and you're like, wait, can I hang out with the Americans? What's up, guys? Because of all the, like, restrictions and everything, I was like, oh, I'm in, like, sports prison. We can't do anything, and we can only do these, like, selected events, like, or selected things when it's, like, the schedule. Sports prison. I'm, I'm, That's a little I'm different than X Games vibe, that's for sure. X Games is not sports prison. <laughs> no, it, I mean, it's also just, like, the time right now with COVID. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's not like the Olympics are like that. Oh, I've been to a few. It's kind of like that. Um... <laughs> What is I don't know because I'm new. I'm a noob. Uh, best tripper tour ever. My favorite trip was when I went to Europe with Birdhouse for the first time, and that was the first like trip I went with the team, and I was so nervous. And we went to all these like rad countries, and everyone was just like having a ball. And I don't know. I was like worried all the dudes would like. I wasn't sure if they would like get along with me or like me and they're all just like so awesome that's cool um the last trick you learned on Bert um I know I've learned more tricks recently but like the last big trick I learned was probably like a backside flip on Bert sick I saw that video that happened like right before I slammed oof but I was really proud of that one. Um, in your opinion, which skater has the best inverts of all time? Probably Neil Blunder. Um, where is your dream skate trip? Copenhagen. Do you believe in aliens? No. I mean, I'm not saying they don't exist, but I'm not like trying to believe in them. Favorite color to dye your hair? Blue. Because I remember when I met you, I think it was green. Maybe? It may have been. For a bit, I dyed it green. But honestly, I feel like a poser just because, like, I'm with Monster. And then I look, uh, like, yeah. too monstered out with, like, everything. <laughs> and I, I, They do make some blue drinks that look similar to that, though. But everyone knows Monster Green. That's true. That's true. Um, everybody wants to know what song is stuck in your head right now. 
Uh, I Don't Want to Talk. Ooh. I Just Want to Dance by Glass Animals. It just came out. Download that. I was listening to it in the car on the way here, and I was so hyped. I literally put in my story because I have been waiting for this song to drop because they, like, released a snippet of it, like, on, like, TikTok and stuff, and people were, like, making TikToks, and I'm just like, where's the rest of that song? Love it. Yeah. That's a wrap. Well, that's the official interview. That's the official interview. It went like that. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. What gloss animals? We got to listen to that on the way home. Yeah, we got to pump that up. Yeah. Unleashed with the Dingo and Danny. Fueled by Monster Energy.